Hello, everyone. This webinar will begin shortly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jose Francisco, Project Manager at the IAS USA. Today's webinar will provide an update on tuberculosis and HIV core infection across the spectrum from latent infection through, disease, through drug susceptible and drug resistant disease. I'd like to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Susan Swindles from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Welcome, Dr. Swindles. Okay. Thank you, Jose. Um, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining. And thank you for those who sent questions to me already. I got some terrific questions um, sent to me that I will do my best to try to address as we go along. So first, a bit of housekeeping. As you all know, this is sponsored by the International Antiviral Society USA and is designated for uh, continuing education credits. This is the number that you get and go to the uh, website after the presentation to claim these. We'd like to thank our uh, platinum, silver and bronze supporters as listed on this slide that um, uh, help keep the trains running here. And so we're very appreciative of their support. We do have a few audience response questions. So there'll be some polling and a separate window for you to respond to the poll. And then we'll look at the results later. There's also an option for submitting questions in the Q&A function. So please do that. And we'll do our best to get to as many of those as possible and I'll try to do some of them after the fact if I can too and have your email addresses and the chat is open for a discussion with each other but if you have questions that you want um, me to look at please put them in the Q&A. So here again is the title slide with my disclosure and here are the objectives for today's webinar. So we're going to talk about where we are with TB globally in general, and then some exciting advances in TB prevention, treatment of drug susceptible TB, and also even treatment of drug resistant TB, which we see not too much of here in the US, but maybe some, but I think it's helpful for you guys to know. Okay, here is our first pretest question, and the poll should be open for you to decide which of the following is the preferred treatment by the CDC for latent TB infection? Nine months of INH, weekly rifampin and isoniazid for three weeks, just close monitoring and only give them something if uh, TB develops or rifampin perzinamide for six months. So which is your best guess as to what's a preferred treatment?
Okay, here we go. These are the results, uh, exactly half. The participants uh, chose option number one, a few thought the next one, and then uh, very few with the other. So we will get back to that shortly. Thank you, Jose. And then the next one, if I just scroll down again. Oh, here we go. Well, my slide's off. Here we are. All right. Pre-test question number two. Standard TB treatment. So this is for disease now. In people with HIV, can be safely administered with which kind of antiretroviral therapy? Which um, uh, backbone for the antiviral therapy? Raltegravir at 1200 daily, Bictegravir at 50 milligrams daily, Lopinavir, Ritonavir 100 twice daily, or Efavirenz 600 milligrams daily. So, talking about normal treatment for TB, Rifampin, INH, Pirazenam, and Ethambutol, if you have someone with HIV, what else? What can they take with it for their antiretroviral therapy? Excellent. We have an assortment here. Um, about a quarter voting each for raltegravir, big tegravir, not so many takers for Lopinavir, Ritonavir, I mean, we really use that very rarely anymore, as we know, and uh, about 40% for efavirenz. So uh, we will get back to that too. So even though we, as I say, we don't see a lot of tuberculosis in the US, we're in the relatively pale green, low incidence setting here is the um, map from the, the WHO of global incidence. It's still a global health problem. It's actually classified as a global health emergency, which honestly doesn't do much good for TB. You know, when COVID got declared an emergency, a lot of things happened, but that is, as you know, a different story, but it's uh, incredibly common globally. 23%, almost a quarter of the world's population is infected with TB, has latent infection. And these are data from WHO most recent available. In 2019, 10 million new cases of TB and 1.2 million in people with HIV and more than 1 million deaths. So it's still an enormous problem. Uh, it's the leading cause of death uh, at least was for from infection in people with HIV. Now, many of these data have been sort of overwhelmed by the tsunami, which is COVID. These are COVID data from WHO. So these are not just for one year, though. This is like forever since it was, you know, invented at the beginning of 2020. So and since I made this slide, even it's already out of date. I think we're about 250 million cases globally and more than 5 million deaths. So there's that for comparison. So uh, uh, as I say, TB is generally a sort of under-resourced and uh, understudied condition, considering how very prevalent it is and how much damage it causes. And I, th I think personally that it's because it's a disease mostly of poor people in poor countries, low and middle income countries are the ones that have the most of it. It's a still a heavily stigmatized sort of so-called dirty disease. And for Europeans and US countries, it's kind of a Victorian disease from the past that they don't have to worry about anymore. We don't have, um, uh, much advocacy for TB. There's some, but it's not, for example, close to the kind of advocacy we are used to in HIV. And there's no like really hot, famous people that came forward and said, oh, I got TB and I did this and I got better and please contribute to the cause. There's very little in it for pharma to make new and better TB drugs because uh, they can only sell them to low middle income countries. And so they're um, not going to make much money on that. And that, you know, you don't blame them for that. That's their business model. And the global funding for TB is still really in terms of other diseases, fairly pitiful. So we lack an effective vaccine. The diagnostics aren't great as we will discuss. And we also, of course, always need better drugs. So this is just an illustration of the incidence of TB over about the last hundred years. This is actually UK data, but USA to look very similar. 
And so the uh, TB case rate just plummeted, mostly in line with better public health overall, less overcrowding, uh, more access to health care, not really specific to TB vaccines or drugs, but it has uh, improved. So in terms of drug development, this is the pipeline for TB drug development, and it's really more of a trickle than a pipeline. So if you look back again, this is over uh, 20 years, and there's not been much when you think about, for example, HIV drug development, and then also a big uh, drought in the the after 1960 before anything was developed, but I'm happy to report that we do have more now. So in contrast, for HIV, which most of us on this call, I think are used to treating, we have this lovely menu of uh, multiple fully active regimens often co-formulated into one tablet, they're well tolerated, they have no side effects, and now we even have an option for injection. So it's a very different landscape. In terms of the targets for the WHO, the numbers they would like to treat and what actually happens, that's also a bit discouraging. For uh, 2018 and 19, the target for TB eradication was to treat 40 million people with TB and they managed 14. And for preventive therapy, the target was to give 30 million people TB preventive therapy. And as you can see, even sadder um, actual numbers there. And we anticipate that because of COVID, these numbers will be even worse because people with uh, infection or actual TB disease are less likely to get healthcare in general because of COVID, maybe less likely to get diagnosed. It's just not a priority. And so the Global Fund estimate probably about a million people, less people were treated for TB in 2020, even though that they, you know, they needed treatment. So a little bit of new information about transmission. You know, for a long time, we've been used to thinking it's an airborne droplet nuclei I think. Someone coughs on you and these droplets uh, land in your airway and then you potentially get infected after exposure. But data from a um, TB meeting this year actually mirrored a little bit what we've learned about COVID, which is that there's probably also aerosol transmission too, which means just uh, by someone breathing on you that has TB, you may be uh, exposed and infected. And that's something that we didn't really quite appreciate before. And even though obviously there's less bacteria in someone's breath than there are when they cough, people don't literally cough all day, but they do breathe all day. And so when you have uh, prolonged exposure, then that's also a potential route by aerosols. So we're also used to thinking of, I've been talking about latent infection and TB disease as if they're two sort of binary issues. And as with many things in medicine, that's not the case. It's more of a spectrum. So people go from uh, exposure, if you look at the bottom box here, uh, some of them, um, will just uh, eliminate any bacteria that get coughed on them or breathed on them by their innate immune responses. Sometimes they have acquired immune responses. Uh, sometimes then they de de develop a prolonged infection state that can be quiescent, so-called subclinical disease where they're infected but not really uh, symptomatic and then active disease in a smaller proportion uh, of people. And so the lifetime risk after infection of going to active disease in most people is about um, 10%. And if you have HIV, it says that's the lifetime risk. If you have HIV, then the annual risk is 10%. So having HIV is a dramatic uh, risk increaser for developing active TB disease if you get infected. But still the take home message is that most exposed slash infected people don't go on to develop disease, which is one of the challenges of TB prevention because you have to treat a lot of people to avoid a case of active disease. Okay, and I'm going the wrong way. All right, here we are with our um, first case that will lead to some audience response questions. So you're in your HIV clinic, a new patient comes who's 34 years old. He was born in Mexico, but has lived in the US for several years. 
he got into the hospital with a community acquired pneumonia and someone thought to do an HIV test, which was positive. He got started on antiretroviral therapy here, as you can see. And his last CD4 count was up to 120. His virus load was undetectable. This was a case from a couple of years ago, so not the you know less than 20 copies we have now, but overall doing pretty well. So in your clinic, you test him for latent TB, in this case with an interferon gamma release assay, and you get a result which is undeterminate. So what to do? What do you do now? Do you rule out active TB and treat him for latent infection? Do you do a TB skin test? Remember, we did an IGRA test to begin with. Do you wait and repeat the uh, quantiferon test, the IGRA test, when his counts are higher? Uh, or you just keep doing it until you get a result that you like. Excellent. Okay, so a third of you would actually rule out TB and treat him because indeterminant is sort of positive and you could maybe make a case for that. I'm not sure I agree, but... Uh, TB skin testing is an option, and actually in the um, uh, ATS guidelines, I think it says, you know, that would be something you could do if you get an indeterminate eye grade, then do a TB skin test. I don't think that's based on any evidence that I'm aware of. Uh, repeating the eye grade when CD4 count is higher, third did that, that would be the answer that I would agree with. And then uh, some people would just keep doing it until they get an answer that they like. So what do we know about, what can I tell you a little bit about testing for latent TB infection? Well, first of all, we don't have any direct measure, even though we know patients probably have mycobacteria in their body, probably in their lungs, maybe in their lymph nodes, there's no way to actually detect that. There's no test for that. Uh, sputum culture will be negative. Uh, there's no other easy way of finding these bacteria in their body because there's just not very many of them. They're very sparse and sort of hidden. And so what we're left with are indirect tests. And there's two. There's a TB skin test, which induces a direct type hypersensitivity reaction in people that are infected. And then there's this interferon gamma release assay, which measures immune response with, with through interferon to TB in whole blood. So one is obviously a skin test, which you can read up to a week later. In my experience, people that know how to read these are few and far between. A lot of people just measure if there is erythema, they measure that, which would be incorrect. You have to measure in duration, which is a trickier thing to actually measure. Uh, if you have someone with HIV uh, tests of more than five millimeters of induration is considered positive. They don't have HIV, it's 10. And then the blood tests are, are simpler, only requires one visit. You just put whole blood into uh, all of the tubes you see here. So there's quite a lot of tubes that have to be filled, difficult to do with small children, sometimes even difficult to do with grownups too. Uh, but that's what needs to be done. But the performance characteristics are not fantastic. So 70% sensitivity overall, uh, less if people have HIV. This is not fantastic for a screening test. You know, you think about the screening tests that we have for HIV, which are almost 100% sensitive and specific. Fantastic tests. These are a long way from that. So they will miss people who have TB infection, but have a negative test. And if someone has a low CD4 count, they're much more likely to have energy in the case, taste, uh, the case of a skin test or an indeterminate uh, interferon gamma release assay. And the low usually is about less than 200. It's our traditional definition of low CD4. So if someone has a positive test, they're likely to have a positive test forever. There's no benefit really to repeating this. Um, I'm trying to think of the other, I did have a few, quite a lot of questions about this in the pre-registration. And I know that a lot of you deal with this. We used to deal with this a lot with healthcare workers who were required to have TB, uh, annual TB testing by one or other of these methods. And that's not recommended anymore in the US because our numbers are so low. It just led to confusion and um, uh, unnecessary extra testing. So really now we only test 
healthcare workers when they, where there's uh, exposure or suspicion is high. Uh, questions about how often patient, people with HIV should be screened for latent TB. The guidelines say do it at baseline and then um, consider annually or in the event of uh, exposure or uh, suspicion for um, uh, infection. So in where I live here in the Midwest, we have very low TB incidence and we honestly don't actually do it annually. Although I think probably if I lived in San Diego, or Miami or New York, then uh, I would. Um, which is better? There was a question about that. So the uh, answer is mostly that the uh, IGRA tests do have better sensitivity and specificity. The big advantage is that uh, it's a one-shot thing, you know, it just won't come once for a um, blood test. You don't have to worry about them not coming back for having their test read. And I don't think I put this on the slide, but people that have had BCG as children that came from um, many other countries um, in the world, such as I grew up in England, I had a BCG vaccine as a child and have a positive TB skin test. I always like to say because of that, not sure that's true, but that will cause a positive skin test. If you get this other test, it does not show up positive because of BCG. So that's a huge advantage if you have someone that grew up somewhere else and got BCG uh, vaccine. And I think that's mostly it. Oh, I know. The other excellent question I got is that, uh, how does this interact with COVID vaccination, getting this uh, TB, TB testing? Excellent question. So there's no um, concern that doing this test is going to interfere with response to a COVID vaccine. You can do both of them at the same time without any trouble. But the CDC recommend, I think on the basis of no evidence, but maybe common sense, that if you've just given someone a COVID vaccine, uh, uh, wait for uh, up to four weeks before you do your TB skin test, just in case you get a positive test. I don't think there's any evidence for that. I think it's more based on common sense, but that's what's uh, in the CDC guidance. So what about uh, excluding TB? So you get someone with a positive test, the first thing you've got to worry about is do they actually have TB disease? So uh, the tools that we have available to exclude TB are symptom screen, chest x-ray, and then diagnostics as shown here. So the symptom screen for TB is looking at the four cardinal symptoms of tuberculosis, fever, night sweats, uh, weight loss, and cough. It used to be cough for a certain duration, now it's cough of any duration. So you ask them, do you have a fever? Do you have your lost weight? Do you have night sweats? Do you, are you coughing? Any one of those uh, positive tests should tr uh, positive symptoms should trigger more testing. So uh, the next step would be a chest X-ray, and if all of those things are negative, no symptoms, no normal chest X-ray, chance of active TB disease, even in someone with HIV, is extremely small. If you have a really high index of suspicion for whatever reason. Um, maybe for a country that they've come from or uh, exposure that they have, or you really think they still might have TB, you can try to get a sputum test. I'm so often surprised how many people, even though they say they don't have a cough, they can still cough, produce some sputum. And so for the last two centuries, the best way to test the sputum was a Zeal Nielsen test, acid fast stain, and TB will stain red, as shown in this picture. And so this is a, a so-called sputum smear test, not very sensitive, but uh, very specific for TB, but not particularly sensitive. But we have got done better than that now. We have now much more rapid and automated molecular-based tests for diagnosis of TB. And the most commonly used one is the so-called expert test, which is really pretty simple. You put sputum in a cartridge, you put it in this machine, which is a bit like, I always like to say, a 
complicated European coffee machine, but it's about, you know, espresso machine is about as complicated as that, which, you know, it's not nothing, but it's not that hard. And then in a couple of hours, you get a result, TB, yes, no. If there's TB, does it have drug, uh, rifampin susceptibility? So excellent test available, very many places in the world. You probably have one in your own hospital. There are also other molecular based tests that will give you um, susceptibility to more than just rifampicin. They will tell you if it's INS susceptible too. So these tests are all excellent. And there is quite good evidence that as a screening test for TB, these add a lot. If you have someone with HIV that you're really worried about might actually have TB or if they have a positive symptom. So that's what you do next. We do have finally a really nice pipeline of better TB diagnostics. Here's some examples. Some of them are handheld. Some of them can be used as point of care testing in the field. Unfortunately, nearly pretty much all of them are still sputum based, which is still a huge barrier. Not everyone can produce sputum. Small children can't. People that don't really cough can't. It's sort of gross, you can't aliquot it. You know, there's very many problems with sputum-based tests. Some of these are based on urine, though they work quite well for people with HIV and low CD4 counts. Otherwise, we don't have an easy diagnostic test such as we do for HIV, you know, based on um, antibodies and then a viral load. Nothing like that for TB, sadly. So. Uh, we still like, as I say, a highly accurate test of infection. You, you saw what we have, not perfect, but that's what we have. We don't have a way to know if you treat someone with preventive therapy, are they cured of this latent infection? There's no way to establish that. Repeating uh, um, any of those IGRA tests does not help you. Um, and we talked about predictors of progression to disease, We're lacking a non-sputum-based diagnostic, also lacking a, a marker of treatment response for active disease, you know, to see that patients are responding to therapy and getting better. Again, another blunt instrument, you know, if they have a positive culture and then it goes negative, that's about the best we can do in terms of proving that we've cured someone. So still a lot of work that needs to be done with TB diagnostics. But uh, we do have uh, preventive therapy that works, not fabulous, but it works. And so this is a meta-analysis of very many randomized clinical trials in people with HIV, uh, with and without evidence of latent infection who were given isoniazid preventive therapy. And as you can see here, overall reduction in people with evidence of infection, a positive PPD or skin test is about a 60% reduction. As I say, not fabulous, but really pretty good. And one of the best tools that we have. Uh, less effective in people without a positive skin test, but if they have HIV and live in a high burden setting, uh, they probably will still benefit too. So this is an effective intervention, grossly underutilized. This is the treatment cascade for TB preventive therapy. So of maybe a hundred people intended for screening, a lot of them don't get tested. If they do, they may not get the result. They don't get referred for a proper evaluation. Maybe a third get recommended to go on preventive therapy. And of them, 20% on a good day will complete treatment. So really a pretty sad cascade here, you know, to considering that we do have an effective intervention. And so why is this? Well, the main reason is that TB preventive therapy just uh, takes too long. You know, right now we have six to ninth month regimens. Most people get fed up with taking a pill that every day for a disease they don't even have. There is a realistic concern about adverse events. TB drugs are not all entirely well tolerated. So you will cause, for example, liver toxicity, possibly in someone who uh, was perfectly fine to begin with. Providers worry that they're gonna miss active disease and giving preventive therapy will breed resistance. That doesn't, there's no evidence that's actually true, but it's a barrier, people worry about it. And previously, of course, with people with HIV, prioritizing getting them on antiretroviral therapy has been the main driver and TB preventive therapy kind of took a back seat. Having said that, there is also good evidence that getting people on, on antiviral therapy is a good TB preventive. 
and uh, actually works quite well in preventing TB, uh, ir uh, um, regard whether or not they take TB preventive therapy. So independent of TB preventive therapy, just starting someone on antiviral therapy, getting their CD4 counts up, all good, all helps to prevent TB. Okay, so our man that we tested for um, TB and had an indeterminate test, his CD4 count comes up to 300 and his test is now clearly positive. You ask him about the signs and symptoms of active TB, he's got nothing. He's got a normal chest X-ray, so you consider him for latent infection or TB preventive therapy. That basically means the same thing. Would you offer him nine months of INH, weekly INH, and RPT is rifapentin. I probably should have spelled that out, sorry, but there is now a, a, a regimen available of weekly INH and rifapentin for three months. Would you not treat him at all? Or want to do further evaluation to make sure he doesn't actually have TB? So those are the choices. Excellent. Okay, so pretty much everyone wants to treat him, which I'm happy to see. Most people want to treat him with INH, which I'm also very pleased to see. And there are some, about a third of respondents thought that uh, the weekly INH rifapentin option was a good one. Well, what I didn't remind you of is his antiretroviral regimen, which as you may remember, includes a booster, which leads to um, many issues with drug-drug interactions we will discuss shortly. So briefly, these are now the preferred treatment options for TB preventive therapy from CDC. This three months of once weekly isoniazid plus rifapentin, four months of daily rifapentin. Now this is not, I should add, uh, specific to people with HIV. This is for everyone. The CDC don't have specific uh, HIV related guidelines necessarily. Uh, so they recommend for four months of daily rifampin and uh, an option for three months of di daily isoniazid plus rifampin, so-called 3HR. We have all these initials for TB just to keep everyone confused. WHO also still includes the six to nine month isoniazid regimen, which I think in this case would be um, the, uh, one of the optimal ones to consider. So I just would like to talk very briefly about a study called Brief TB, which I was involved with, which is based on studies from uh, uh, mice. So one of the problems with designing interventional trials for latent infection is, as I say, you can't find the infection in people to be able to see if you can make it go away, but you can in mice. So you can infect mice with something that looks like latent TB, and then uh, you're allowed to sacrifice them later and look in their lungs and see how much bacteria was there to begin with and at the end. So based on mouse data, looking at untreated in the blue line, the, those treated with a standard INH prevention, or INH with rifampin, which is so-called PH, it looked like four weeks looked pretty good. So briefly, this rifapentin, the so-called P drug, is one of the rifamycins. There are three in the rifamycin class. The one we call rifampin on the left, rest of the world calls it rifampicin, same thing, exact same thing. That's the main one. There's also rifabutin, which we have access to here in the US, and then there's rifapentin, which has these pentyl rings. And what that gives it is a longer half-life, and so more potency, potentially against MTB, against um, the bacteria, but also more drug-drug interactions. That's what DDI stands for, uh, but similar side effects to the others. So for this brief TB study, we did a big trial to see if this four weeks of daily rifapentin with isoniazid was as good as the standard, which was nine months of daily isoniazid in people with TB. It was a big study. Uh, you have to do big studies in uh, TB prevention because as I say, most people with latent infection don't actually get TB and your endpoint has to be actually getting TB. How many people get TB at the end of the day? 
And so this was the um, patient characteristics of the brief TB trial. You can see that uh, only about a small number of them, 15% uh, were in North America or the Caribbean. It was done mostly in high burden countries elsewhere, about half and half men and women, uh, median CD4 count of about 400 and uh, the um, uh, stratification at the bottom. So after enrolling all of these people and giving them either weekly rifepentin and INH or daily isoniazid, we were thrilled to learn at the end of our follow-up period that results were exactly the same for both regimens. So this one month of daily rifepentin and INH is as good at preventing TB in people with HIV. So this is uh, uh, an excellent finding. These are, this is the treatment completion rates. These are actually the best recorded in any clinical trial. They won't be the same in real life, but 97% treatment completion is the best ever for TB preventive therapy. And we're hoping once it gets rolled out in the real world that we'll see something like that. But we did have to worry about drug-drug interactions because of using the rifapentin, rifamycins all have uh, huge problems with drug-drug interactions. So we tested uh, in the ASK brief TB study only with patients on efavirenz. I'm happy to report nothing happened. So you can use this regimen people with efavirenz. Of course, we've used that so much less now in the US. It's maybe not such an attractive option, but it's possible. We also looked at nivirapine, which was not an option. So not that we use much of that, but don't use it here. So in summary for this so-called 1HP or one monthly regimen of isoniazid and rifapentin, uh, it was not inferior, it did really well. It was safe and effective, can be used with efavirenz. Completion was great. And so this is an option that is now being looked at by the people that develop guidelines such as WHO, CDC, ATS, uh, IAS USA, and so on. Uh, it's listed as an alternative for WHO, but not incorporated in any other firm guidelines yet, but maybe uh, will be an option going forward. So, as I mentioned, uh, rifampin is sort of the mother of all drug interactions. You know, there's all these different ways that um, drugs can interact through metabolizing enzymes, through genes, through transporters. The rifamycins get catch all of them, so they cause very many problems. And so, if you are picking a preventive regimen for someone with HIV on antiretroviral therapy, please be very careful about which one you pick and look at um, whatever resource you use to make sure that you have an option that works. And so. Uh, these are the sort of compatible regimens in the middle column here for all of the different regimens. I won't go into any great detail here, but just to say um, this is a work in progress. There are some interaction studies still ongoing, but in the interim, the uh, HA, the DHHS uh, um, antiviral treatment guidelines have wonderful drug interaction tables which are updated regularly and would be an excellent resource. University of Liverpool, which is the bottom where, um, URL here, also has an excellent drug interaction resource where you can plug in your antiviral therapy and then your uh, TB therapy and see what kind of interactions you might be running up against before you do that. So I think those are most of the questions we had about latent infection. Let me just look real quick in uh, these. Yes, I think we've covered most of the questions I had in the pre-registration about latent infection, which is a big issue for us here that we deal with in the US. But I do want to talk a little bit about some developments in treatment of actual disease, which we all see some. And uh, you may want to use an expert consult consultant for this, or maybe you uh, can do this on your own if you see a lot of it. So here is a case of a 50 or four year old woman that comes to your hospital. She has cough, fever and weight loss. She's got, uh, she gets an HIV test on admission because of that. A CD4 count is only 70, viral load 120. And she has the uh, chest X-ray findings you see here. So there is suspicion for TB. Someone gets an AFB smear, which we talked about, which is negative. And she also gets a bronchoscopy, 
make sure she doesn't have new assistors, and that's negative too. But she gets this expert test, which we talked about, which is more sensitive. And so that's positive. She gets diagnosed with TB based on that. Sputum is sent for culture, which as you know, takes weeks. So we don't have results from that. But in the interim, she gets started on standard TB therapy, isoniazid, rifampin, inflammatory, and paracinamide. As you know, she just got diagnosed with HIV infection. So she's also going to need antiretroviral therapy. When should she start that? Soon as possible, ideally within two weeks, within eight weeks, or after she's done with her TB treatment at the end of six weeks. Those are, oops, sorry. Those are the choices. And then there should be a poll, maybe yes. Lovely, thank you. Excellent. Okay, so nearly everyone wants to start as soon as possible. Excellent answer. Some would wait for eight weeks and nobody would wait for the end of TB treatment, which is great because that would not be the best way to do it. And so what are the data we have to um, inform this decision? Well, it's all based on three large uh, multi-center randomized clinical trials or multi-continent. Some of them were actually only done in one continent. Um, that were uh, done all or, or 10 years ago now will, will not be repeated, but all essentially came up with the same answer. So they all had the same similar design, which was immediate or deferred antiretroviral therapy in the setting of uh, tuberculosis infection. So when someone's diagnosed with TB, when should you start? And all had almost exactly the same results. So in the green bar is the immediate start and in the purple is so-called early, which means really, you know, not so early, later on start of antiretroviral therapy in all these three trials. And they all showed that early antiretroviral therapy improves survival in people with low CD4 counts, no risk of increased adverse events, always a worry with all of the drugs you're throwing at people, but some increase in this issue called IRIS, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, because of starting uh, antiretroviral therapy so early. And so what these data support is that if you have a low CD4 count, in this case, very low, less than 50, that immediate, which is basically within two weeks, antiretroviral therapy is the way to go. If they have a, a count a little bit higher, you can wait. And so all of the current guidelines recommend uh, within this, within two weeks for less than 50 and within eight weeks for less than, for greater than 50. So in our patient, I think I gave her a C4 kind of 120, so it's kind of in the middle. But uh, starting within two weeks, I think, is um, uh, a great idea. You will have to worry about iris. You may have trouble with that. But overall, there's not a lot of other downside. People tolerate this well. As we know, antiretroviral therapy is good for everyone with HIV. And generally speaking, the sooner the better. The only exception is if you worry or if they, you know that they have TB meningitis. So there's a bit like cryptococcal meningitis when starting antiretroviral therapy causes an immune um, inflammatory reaction in the brain with, without room to expand and bad things follow. So don't do it if you have TB meningitis. And so just in terms of uh, drug interactions again and uh, suitable regimens to put with drug susceptible standard TB therapy, which is listed here, uh, the bottom is sort of a, um, a bit of a snapshot of some of the regimens that you can use with standard TB therapy. Notice that the second one includes rifabutin as an alternative for rifampin, which is done quite often in the US, not so much in the rest of the world because it's not available there, but that's an option too. But again, another case of needing to be very careful about looking for drug drug interactions before you embark on this. And some of our um, you know, more recent therapies are not included. Notice big Tegravir not on this list, nor will it be because that doesn't seem to go with rifampin at all, but there are other interfaces. So on the good news front, 
right now the current therapy for drug susceptible TB is six months, which is a really long time. Everyone gets fed up with it. Most states require directly observed therapy. Someone has to have a person from the health department come and knock on their door every day. So really not much fun. But for the first time in 40 years, we have actually proved uh, evidence that we can shorten um, TB therapy using uh, some of these um, more modern TB drugs that we have available. These are all licensed drugs, though, nothing in investigational. This was based on, again, mouse data, but then also uh, phase two data looking at rifapentin in higher doses, which looked promising for treating drug susceptible TB. And so this led to the birth of so-called study 31, also an ACTG study 5349, looking at treatment shortening with rifapentin. And what the options were here is the top row here is the control of standard TB therapy. And the alternative other two arms were uh, rifapentin substituted for rifampin at higher dose and or moxifloxacin substituted for ethambutol. So the two arms, both each for four months, follow up the primary endpoint was who had a cure of TB at 12 months post randomization. These are the eligibility criteria for the study. Uh, if they had HIV, they could be on efavirenz. That was a bit complicated. I'll explain that in just a second, but it was a standard kind of TB treatment trial. They had um, positive expert or smear and uh, no um, drug resistant TB. There's the outcome. Cure means uh, sputum when the culture went negative, the x-ray got better and uh, symptoms resolved. And so in the two treatment arms, here is the one with rifapentin and moxifloxacin. As you can see uh, in the blue box, this is the non-inferiority margin, which was just 6.6%. Um, these, uh, for all of the eligible populations, uh, this regimen met the non-inferiority margin. So rifapentin high dose with moxifloxacin uh, 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 for four months is as good as standard TB treatment. Just using rifapentin did not though, as you can see this top exceeded the margin. So this does not work, but we do now have a four month regimen which looked very good. And again, working its way into current guidelines, uh, results were consistent and robust. Safety outcomes, you know, these are not incredibly well tolerated, easy, safe drugs. You can see here, looking at the second bars, treatment related grade three to five adverse events, not uncommon. Quite a lot of patients had these. So this is mostly predictable liver enzymes, neuropathy, that kind of thing. But um, again, you know, not ideally tolerated, but as good as uh, the what we're used to. These are the um, actual listing of the adverse events. You can see here that a lot of them were uh, either neutropenia or elevated liver enzymes is what we're used to. Now, because this regimen included moxifloxacin, everybody worried about QT prolongation and cardiotoxicity. You can see that actually only three participants had that. Uh, one of them had just a regular heart attack, only one with QT prolongation. So actually it wasn't an issue, which is great. We also had a subset of patients with HIV that were in this big trial. They also had uh, uh, not, a, not a huge number, but they also had excellent results. Uh, again, meeting non-inferiority margins for rifapentin and moxifloxacin. So it worked just as well in people with HIV, maybe even a tiny bit better, but this we were very pleased to see. We did have to do this complicated kind of staging system. So we worried about the uh, interaction between this high dose rifapentin and antiretroviral therapy. So we restricted it to only efavirenz. And then to start off with, we studied it in patients who were already on efavirenz. And unfortunately, that took a really long time to 
find enough patients to study because people that are on antiviral therapy, as we talked about, don't actually get TB, but our science did finally find some. And so we were able to find some that were on efavirenz, make sure that their efavirenz levels didn't go down the toilet, which they didn't. And then we could have people starting efavirenz, which is a much more common scenario. And so these are the results for what happened to the efavirenz levels where people were already on it. So really nothing happened, which is ideal in terms of concentrations, maybe a smidge more clearance, but not enough to worry about. And then this is for people starting efavirenz after they got diagnosed with TB. Again, nothing happened. So efavirenz works well with this. We do need data, of course, on other antiretroviral agents which are being uh, studied. There is a study in development to actually look at that. And so um, in terms of co-infected patients, this regimen works really well. No uh, uh, interactions with efavirenz and we're looking at um, other, other potential antiviral therapy to see what you can take with this. So uh, I showed you the TB pipeline at the beginning. I'm happy to report that now in 2021, nearly 2022 is looking much better. You can see our rifampentin moxi regimen in phase three, which has been a success. But we do have some new TB drugs that you may not be as familiar with. I just wanted to touch on very briefly, bedaquiline, delaminid, and protominid. And these are approved by the FDA for use in the, in the US for drug-resistant TB. So this isn't something you're gonna see much of, but I just wanted you to be aware that they exist. You may see patients that are on them and there are some uh, issues to consider, which we'll talk about in just a second. Before that, though, I just wanted to uh, go over our, another management issue with our TB patient in the hospital. As you know, she started her TB treatment. She starts her TB uh, antiretroviral therapy after a week, as most of us would agree is a, a good interval to start soon. But 10 days later, she starts to look worse. She has a recurrent fever, her cough is worse, chest x-ray looks worse. And so you think, oh dear, she's got this immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So you start to make sure she doesn't actually have drug resistant TB or histo or something else. But assuming this is what she has, what would you do about it? Would you give her a tapering course of prednisone? Would you stop her antiretroviral therapy? Would you give her just non-steroidals? or sit tight and do nothing and just um, be brave and hope for the best. Those are the choices. Okay. Everyone wants to give up prednisone, excellent answer. Very few want to stop her antiviral therapy, which would be the wrong thing to do. You, you know, in general, we continue that through hell or high water these days. NSAIDs, I think would be fine. Not a lot of evidence that they help a lot, but doesn't really hurt much. And then a few would just do nothing, which is also, I think, a very defensible position. So in terms of actual data, just to help us guide this, um, as in this case, iris, this iris is more common with early antiviral therapy, particularly with low CD4 counts. It's more of a nuisance, really. Yeah, the occasional cases where it causes people to be really ill, you know, if they get wicked, like cervical adenitis all around their neck and they can't breathe, that's a big problem. But most people don't die of this, but it just uh, gets everyone upset and causes confusion and nobody knows what to do. And it's a big worry. And so I think making sure you're on the right you have the right diagnosis. There's no diagnostic test for this, except that, as I'm always telling the residents here, that it's called immune reconstitution. So you do want some evidence of re immune reconstitution. So ideally you want to make sure the CD4 count did actually go up to say that yes, it's reconstituting and that's most likely what's happening. There's no you know, hard and fast rule for that, but an increase of about 50 cells is the kind of industry standard. So you want to make sure the SSCD4 count went up. Um, you want to make sure she doesn't have drug resistant TB. You know, if she's been in the hospital or on directly observed therapy, unlikely. Of course, people with one OI, such as TB, can have another. She could have histo, CMV maybe. Um, 
Occasionally people will need surgical drainage, as I mentioned, NSAIDs won't hurt, but don't help much, but there is good, well, pretty good randomized clinical trial data that prednisone in the doses listed here does improve the um, uh, outcomes, uh, symptoms get better and uh, adverse outcomes get less. There's also only one randomized clinical trial looking at prophylactic prednisone. So some people would say, well, if you've got someone with a very low count, give them prophylactic prednisone according to this recipe, and this may also reduce the risk. It's not written in stone in any guidelines. Some of them say you have to do this, but it's an option. And I think in select cases that may be worth considering just so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, very briefly now on drug resistance. Again, something we see little of in the US, which I'm pleased about. I think we all are because this is really unpleasant and scary disease. Uh, the definitions, definitions are always a bit boring really, but I think it's helpful to just know what they are. So MDR-TB, multidrug resistant TB means TB that's resistant to rif rifamycin and isoniazid. If they're also resistant to fluoroquinolones or their bacteria is, it's called pre-extensively drug resistant or pre-XTRTB. And proper XTRTB is resistant to pretty much uh, everything. So rifampin, isoniazid, fluoroquinolones, and at least something in so-called group A drugs. And this is what the WHA calls them. And so I won't go into too much details about what they are, but these are the drugs that are used for treatment of drug resistant TB, including injectables. So that's what's called extensively drug resistant TB. Used to be pretty much a death sentence, but I have some data to share briefly that show that that's not the case anymore. So treatment of this is really pretty awful. Uh, people have to take very many drugs, at least five, usually for about 18 months, or at least used to. There is now a so-called Bangladesh regimen of nine months, which is endorsed for people who don't have fluoroquinolone resistance. A lot of the evidence base for this is poor Many of these regimens haven't been tested in proper randomized clinical trials, but this is what we have. Some of the drugs are horrible, you know, the daily injections everybody hates. Long-term aminoglycosides such as amikacin makes people deaf. Um, the drugs called neuropathy, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues with it. So if you do have a patient who has this, I would recommend you get an expert consultation. But we do actually have a ray of sunshine in the form of the NICS TB trial, which started a few years ago and published last year, using some of these new drugs that I talked about. So this included this protominid and bedaquilin, both of these new drugs for drug resistant TB. And in this case, also linazolid, not something you think of necessarily as a TB drug, but it has good activity against MTB. But again, you know, long-term therapy with linazolid, as we all know, those of us that treat, you know, staph aureus and all these other things, not simple. But um, in this so-called NICS-TB, relatively small trial, people who got this regimen of bedaquiline prominent and linazolid, about half of them also had HAV, 66% of them were cured of their TB, which is fantastic. And the best results ever happened ever in the history of drug resistant TB. So we're all thrilled about this. Again, as you can see, toxicity was uh, relatively common. And so there was a follow on study looking at maybe a bit less than azolid. So we get a bit less myelosuppression and neuropathy, but it's still fantastically uh, helpful. And so uh, these, as these, these Kaplan-Meier curves show, time to culture, negative status, unprecedented, fantastic. And my friend Francesca Conradi, who is the lead author of this, said it for many of her patients, it was like Lazarus rose from the dead. And so this is great. So we do have options now for treating of uh, extensively drug resistant TB. Some of these are also being used now in clinical trials for just regular drug resistant TB. And I think we'll see some good results and some hoping that we'll get better, shorter, more tolerable regimens for drug resistant TB too. So in summary, progress in TB is slow and it just, uh, it just is. You know, it's a slow disease to come on and it's slow to get better and uh, advances and improvements are also slow. But we do now have 
a so-called ultra short course TB preventive therapy regimen, which I think could really be a game changer if we can get it to work with, for example, Dalutegravir, that could be great. For the first time in 40 years, we have a four month regimen for drug susceptible TB, which will be a very welcome improvement, major improvements in treatment of drug resistant TB, but there's a but, uh, still no decent vaccine. There's some vaccine trials going on, nothing really earth shattering yet. There's some candidates in development in clinical trials, maybe we'll get better. But um, maybe, you know, all this exciting COVID vaccine work with these mRNA vaccines will spur some interest in TB vaccines and all good, something good might come from that. Uh, lacking the diagnostics that we talk about, even shorter regimens for TB treatment would be great, you know, three months, two months, one month, maybe one long acting injection, but we're a long way off that. But I'm going to, I think, oh yes, and uh, I didn't talk much about children because, uh, I'm not, not personally not a pediatrician, but uh, as with many other things in infectious disease, uh, formulations of these drugs for children are lacking. We don't have the right doses. They're um, often not included in cl clinical trials. More difficult to study. You can't get sputum out of small children. Difficult to actually diagnose TB. And then, of course, everyone's very nervous about giving these drugs to pregnant women. And so they get by default excluded and we left you know, just um, hoping for the best in treatment of pregnant women, which is another sad scenario. Okay, so just going back to now our post-test, revisiting the preferred treatment option by the CDC for um, latent TB infection. Again, this is isoniazid for nine months, rifampin and isoniazid for three months, close monitoring or rifampin and prisinamide for six months. Excellent, okay. So uh, as I mentioned, the CDC actually do now prefer the shorter regimens, but personally, I still think for people with HIV that using the nine month ionized regimen is an excellent option because you can use that with any antiretroviral therapy without worrying about it. The only thing you have to worry about is whether you're gonna take their medicine for uh, nine months, which is of course a big challenge as many of you know that have tried to do this. So I did have a question also about monitoring when people are on latent TB infection that I might just address really quickly, which I now can't find. But um, that's another thing that is always a worry. You know, how often do you have to see people that are on TB preventive therapy? How often you should you do blood work on them to check their liver enzymes? So the guidelines say, you know, see them monthly. I think honestly, that's a bit unreasonable particularly for people that are doing really well on it. So the thing to, to uh, worry about, particularly mostly with isoniazid-based regimens and also rifamycin ones is elevation of liver enzymes. As far as the INH is concerned, that will happen usually in the first three months. So if you check someone's liver enzymes for three months and they're fine, I personally don't uh, uh, feel that you have to check them that often for the rest of the duration. If they have co-infection with hepatitis B, C, you have to worry about that. If they drink too much alcohol, that's also an issue. And uh, if they're also on a rifamycin, then you might want to keep checking uh, monthly. So it depends a little bit on their co-infections co and comorbidities, but the default is um, monthly uh, monitoring when people are on this. And so if I can go to the next post-test question, Jose. So I need to move my slide, right? Okay, thank you. Duh. So this is again about co-administration co of antiretroviral therapy with standard TB treatment, which is the, um, which option can you use safely with Rifampin, INH, ethambutol, and prisinamide.
excellent. So, um, most people thought if I was, which is, I consider the correct answer, uh, even though, like I say, we don't really use it much and it may not be that uh, attractive to people, but you know, when they've got TB, then that does sort of change the landscape. Uh, no pin of and nobody wants to use that, completely agree, that just makes people very ill. Big Tegravir, not an option. If you've got rifampin on board, your Big Tegravir levels will be sub-therapeutic and you'll be at risk for treatment failure, so don't use that one. Ral Tegravir is close, but actually a bit of a trick question because you need a bit more than um, the uh, once daily regimen. You need to go to a twice daily regimen with Ral Tegravir, but that is a potentially safe option for uh, someone with TB treatment. Okay. I think we are at the end of the formal presentation and now I need to look in the Q&A, right, Jose? Is that the way this works? Shall I stop sharing my screen? Yes. I think yes. And then look at the Q&A and see what I can answer quickly in the time that we have available. And so, Somebody asked a question. I mean, see if I can read this. Matan Ahmed, I'm sorry if I've mangled your name. How likely is a person with risk when exposed to aerosol? Excellent question. Um, no data yet. This is very new that, you know, aerosol transmission is a thing. It's based on sort of studies in a lab. And so it's more theoretical than real, but it's definitely likely. But you know, how much exposure, how close do you have to be? How many hours do you have to be in the same room, in the same bus, in the same workplace? Uh, we don't actually have an answer to that yet. And so um, that's always a, an issue. There is a sort of definition of what's considered a close contact or a household contact that the CDC have, which my doing from memory is always dangerous, but it's going to be something like, I think four hours in the uh, same airspace with, you know, within a, a day. So um, yeah, risk of transmission is, is, is hard to actually quantify, but, you know, living in the same house, sleeping in the same room is the highest kind of risk of transmission, but living in the same house is one, you know, taking your meals together, being in a workplace or school together, congregate settings, prisons, submarines, you know, those are all, <coughs> excuse me, increase your risk of transmission, but it's um, difficult to quantify. You kind of have to use your judgment if you have a patient that you consider maybe at risk of, of actual uh, TB exposure. So question about how often the child vaccinated with BCG test positive with a TST test? I think that's also uh, pretty common. So um, I can't give you a number for that too, but uh, I think, you know, the other way around, a high uh, proportion of positive TB skin tests and people with BCG vaccination is attributed to their BCG. Whether or not that's actually true, I don't know, but there isn't a, an agreed upon necessary metric with that. What would you do with an indeterminate IGRA? person with more than 200 and no symptoms? That's a really good question. And so I um, personally would probably, uh, let me think about this. I would probably wait and do a repeat test. I don't think doing a skin test would really get you very far. If they had really no risk of exposure, if they were US born and bred and never really went outside like Iowa, for example, I probably wouldn't worry about too much that they ought to be getting preventive therapy when they're not. Um, but, you know, there's some downside to giving people INH preventive therapy or other TB preventive therapy, as we talked about. There are risks for side effects. The drug's not expensive, but it's an extra burden, and you have to worry about drug-drug interactions. So you do have, have a reasonable threshold of risk of actually developing TB. And so if they only had an indeterminate one, I probably wouldn't treat them based on that, but I would like some other evidence to push me into saying, yes, this person needs TB um, 
preventive therapy. So where am I now? I'll have to keep, uh, oh, I know, good question about using rifabutin for four months as a uh, treatment for LTBI. A lot of people would like to do this. Rifabutin is an attractive drug because of the lack of drug-drug interactions. The problem is that there's so little data about, even for TB treatment, you know, there's a Cochrane review of all of the data on rifabutin for TB treatment. It was published a few years ago. Jerry Davies is the first author, and they looked at all of the data on use of rifabutin and couldn't even conclude that it was a good option for treatment of active disease based on the amount and the quality of the data that was presented. People will do it in the US because it's easier. It's pretty well tolerated. They have this, this there is this uveitis phenomenon that seems to be more common in people with HIV. So they have to keep going to the eye doctor. And if they get that, that can be quite uh, troubling, takes a while to go away, it usually does go away, but, uh, uh, but you're really not on a very strong evidence base for treating TB with rifibutin. Probably it will work. Most people will get better using that, but for prevention, even less data. And so, as I think I've probably outlined, doing TB preventive therapy studies, you have to have thousands of people. It takes years. It costs millions of dollars. It's difficult to do. I doubt anyone is going to do a rifibutin-based TB study. If you look at mouse data, it looks pretty good. But if you, uh, you want to use it for preventive therapy, you would be doing it in a sort of evidence-free zone. And I uh, personally wouldn't recommend it, but if uh, you know push came to shove and you had to, then yes. So um, better assays tested uh, in the research pipeline. Terence Donovan asks that. So I'm um, assuming you mean diagnostic tests, then definitely, yes, there are. Again, as I said, they're mostly sputum-based. Oh, if for latent infection, there are a few investigational tests which we're looking at, and some of them are based on what's called the gene signature. And so people who have upregulation of specific marker genes, there's usually like a six or a 10 gene marker panel, that has some predictive value in who's going to get TB and who isn't. Nothing that's ready for prime time yet, but we may end up with a, um, a gene signature test that we can say, you know, this person has evidence of latent infection and based on their gene signature is at high risk for development of disease and should be prioritized for preventive therapy. So I'm hopeful that in the next five to 10 years, we might actually have that. But so far, um, nothing better than the latent infection tests that we have now, which are indirect and imperfect. For actual TB diagnostics, those are getting better and we're getting better tests for response to therapy too. So some molecular tests that look at, um, for example, ribosomal RNA in TB that goes down on treatment and that looks like a promising uh, metric for response to therapy and we don't just have to base everything on culture which is such a blunt instrument you know did the culture go negative and stay negative we'll be able to look at this so-called rs ratio which is ribosomal synthase ratio so that's a promising um assay in development nikki reagan someone i know asking how effective are bcg vaccines and are they considered effective for life no Unfortunately, they're not very good. They work quite well in small children and infants in high endemic areas, but uh, not that great in terms of uh, persistent protection from infection or disease and not good enough to be recommended for uh, widespread use. Uh, for example, we don't use them in the US because they really don't work that well at preventing TB and then they complicate the TB skin test, which is one of our um, best tests for to see if anyone actually has TB. So unfortunately not a great um, vaccine, but as I said, there are others in the pipeline. So maybe we'll end up with um, a better one. So Constantine Benson, Iconic, there are increasing numbers of published studies 
reporting substantial rates of asymptomatic or subclinical TB. And what are our, my thoughts on screening with expert? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You can actually answer this one, but yes, a good one for the audience. So one of the sort of uh, un perhaps unintended consequences of having a better TB diagnostic with this expert test where someone coughs up sputum and uh, may get a positive uh, expert test based on um, the fact that they have a few mycobacteria in their sputum, but maybe don't have classic signs and symptoms of TB disease, they may not have any symptoms, they may have an old chest x-ray, what do you do with them? You know, they probably got some kind of infection, this is what, as Connie said, questions disappeared. But anyway, um, sort of so-called perhaps quiescent or subclinical TB, how do we treat that? Is it enough to give them a preventive regimen? Could you just give them six months of INH and they'd be cured? We don't actually know that. This is a, a definite gap in terms of our clinical trial data that's in need of further study what to do with that. There is a study in children, the name of which has gone straight out of my head, that was presented recently looking at um, this very question in children, which seem to show that, you know, less treatment might be adequate, but we don't have anything yet for adults. So that's an excellent and unanswered question. And one of the issues that you get if you do an expert test on someone with um, uh, maybe subclinical TB, you know, do you want to commit them to six months of therapy? Not really, but um, what else can we do? So for now, we're in a bit of a data-free zone. And somebody, Janice Huber wants to know in a patient with undetectable viral load, you can't find a baseline genotype, would you avoid DDI by using INH or change antiviral therapy to allow a FAMPIN regimen? This is a really good question that comes up a lot. And I don't know, Janice, if you're talking about preventive therapy or treat active disease treatment, but, oh no, you're talking preventive therapy, INH for nine months. Yeah, so, you know, this is a thing where you really got to have a conversation with patients. You know, they don't really like changing the antiviral therapy quite often, as you know, but given the choice of taking something for nine months or maybe just once weekly for three months, some patients in my experience would say, okay, I'll take efavirenz for three months and just be done with it. Others are much less willing. They are on their, you know, big tegravir based regimen and they want to stay on that without change. And then I give them nine months. So there's not exactly a right answer and it depends how, partly how you feel about it and how they feel about it. But either, either option I think uh, is reasonable. And Tara Donovan wants to know with study with the efavirenz, I'm quite sure what you're talking about, but all of the efavirenz DDI studies I referenced, the one for one month of rifapentin INH and then the one for TB treatment were efavirenz with tenofovir. In this case, it would be the disoproxyl fumarate because it was done in mostly international countries, international settings and 3TC. So none of it was just efavirenz. Uh, Daniel Park wants to know, is one month INH rifapentin being considered as a repaired regimen? I would love to say yes, because I'm a co-author on this study, but there are <clears throat> uh, issues in that the study we did was only in people with HIV. So to do a study in people without HIV would have to be even bigger because their risk of TB is less. So then, you know, our study was you know, more than 3,000 3, patients. So then you're talking about an enormous study to prove this works in people without HIV. So I'm not sure it's going to get done. The WHO has listed it already as an alternate for people without HIV. I'm sure it will work in them. We are going to do a, a study in Brazil looking at treatment completion and tolerability in people without HIV, but I doubt we'll ever get the same kind of data. And so it's just going to have to be a bit of a leap of faith, and my guess is CDC and ATS are going to say this is an alternate, if that, um, for people without HIV. And Daniel also asked a question about risk of adrenal suppression. 
with abrupt cessation of prednisone at this dose? No, not an issue. It's a short enough dose that you don't have to worry about that. So um, good question about tapering slowly, but no, I don't think you need to. You can just taper it pretty quickly and people will be fine. Are the recommendations for RIF monoresistance in US settings? Excellent question. Daniel, you're full of them. This is a good one, I like it. So RIF monoresistance means that this is a type of drug resistant TB, but um, patients retain susceptibility to INH. So uh, right now the recommendations are to treat them as if they had MDR TB. Might not be the right thing to do, but that's what all of the recommendations say and so this is another area of need of its own particular study this is a growing um, phenomenon particularly in south africa at the moment they're getting more and more riff mono resistance so quite what you do with that no one's sure but for now the default is to treat them as as if they have mdr tb um, where are we 118 so we're over time and there seem to be people still here, Jose. Yes, we currently yes. have 139 attendees. Oh heavens! Well, those are the. This is excellent. So, um, keep going. So, Christopher Matthews. Chris Matthews wants to know about updates on re risk of TB reinfection. I don't have any exciting updates on that. It is an issue, particularly in the high prevalence countries. Um, we will maybe get a bit of an update on that. So the study 31, 53, 49 trial, which is one of the biggest uh, TB treatment trials, which has been done for quite a while. We do have uh, collected isolates on everyone that basically failed therapy. And we are doing whole genome sequencing on them to see if this was a relapse or a reinfection. Uh, though those uh, studies are not complete, it's taking time, but we will be publishing those coming up soon to give an idea of you know, how many of the treatment failures were relapse and how many were reinfection. I think for now we're looking at about half and half, but we will have some new data on that going forward. Uh, oh, discussing TAF with rifampin. That's an excellent question too. Thank you, Daniel. So this is complicated. So right now, all of the package inserts and um, labels for anything with TAF in it, tenofovir allophenamide says, do not use <coughs> with rifamycin. But we're not sure that's actually correct. And the problem is, not problem, but the issue is that um that the all of the labeling is based on what happens in the plasma and so if you give someone on taf rifamycin the plasma concentrations will go down to levels that are unacceptable but where the taf is actually exerting its action is intracellular so you look at intracellular levels and those look really good in fact even a bit higher than uh with regular tenofovir and so uh, Marta Buffito and her group in London did a study of this in healthy volunteers showing that giving people TAF and rifampin seems to be just fine, but we don't, I don't think we'll be able to convince uh, FDA to change the labels based on that. And unfortunately, the company, the manufacturers, don't have a lot of data about this intracellular concentration that will guide this. And so um, the... <clears throat> There are a couple of studies looking at this in patients because patients and healthy volunteers aren't quite the same. But for now, we don't have any guidance to say, yes, you can use TAF. But I think we ought to be able to, and I think we will be able to. But for now, that um, uh, we can. And you say that you, wherever you live have uh, published a little case series of using it with rifibrutin, which I think is perfectly fine. So yes, we do need more data on that and probably will work. And maybe I'll just do a couple more. How do I approach screening people who've been previously treated for LTBI? So in terms of screening for infection, doing a skin test or an IGRA, if they've been previously treated for, L or for either disease or infection, those are likely to be positive. I won't tell you anything you don't already know. And uh, if they're negative, it doesn't help you either. 
and so I uh, would not. And so in terms of whether or not they may need another round of preventive therapy, that would be entirely predicated on whether or not they had uh, real exposure, which would make you think, yes, we should um, retreat them. But otherwise, I wouldn't do either test in someone previously treated because it's not going to be helpful and will just cause confusion. Okay, I'm going to have to go in a minute. Jose, do you see any other questions you'd like me to answer sort of emergently? I can try to do these by email following, but thank you so much for all of these great questions, all of the interaction and some very nice comments. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Swindles. As a reminder, information on how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow, and this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's live broadcast. We have an upcoming webinar on December 7th regarding the current and future epidemiology of COVID-19. To register, please visit isusa.org. Additionally, we have an upcoming COVID-19 dialogue scheduled for December 3rd, and it will be a continued discussion on COVID-19 in people who are immunocompromised, winning immunity, breakthrough infections, and booster shots. And lastly, we have a course this week on November 19th on PrEP. You may register on the ISUSA website. Lastly, we'd like to thank our presenter, Dr. Swindles, and our audience for your participation. This concludes today's webinar. And let me add my thanks to Dr. Swindells for a tour de force. Thank you. It was fabulous. Thank you. Can I go online down now?